So what a fantastic day. We have a guest who's joined us from overseas. Uh, he's a leadership accelerator, executive leadership coach, international best-selling author. And of course, I have competition because he's a podcast host as well and a keynote speaker. So our guest today is Eddie Turner. He is an in-demand leadership development expert. Definitely in demand, I'm sure. Uh, also changing the face of leadership as a principal consultant and executive coach at Linkage uh, Inc., an international leadership development firm. We'll talk more about that. Eddie is a certified speaking professional and ranked number six on the top 30 list of motivational speakers by Global Gurus. My goodness. Forbes recognized Eddie as the prominent authority on emerging leaders. He ranked number 18 on top 25 thought leaders in leadership by Thinkers360, and the list goes on. Eddie, you are also one of the Marshall Goldsmith's 100 coaches. Welcome to the Second Act podcast. Um, I normally get speakers who have one act, two acts, but it seems like you have many acts. So welcome, and it's a privilege to have you. Um, how are you feeling? Archana, Archana, thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Eddie. And I know that um, motivational speaking is something that, you know, you do very flawlessly. Why don't we start your journey with that? How did you become a motivational speaker? Truth be told, I didn't set out on a path to become a motivational speaker. I started speaking a perhaps around the age of 12 or 13, uh, publicly uh, in my congregation, in my religious world. And uh, that led to more speeches in school and other forums in the community. And fast forward, uh, probably, I guess, 20 years later, I was on a journey to become a, a, a certified professional coach. Mm -hmm. And through that journey, I was led to the National Speakers Association. And through that, that put me on the path to professional speaking where I am today. And I would still always tell people that I was a leadership speaker who tried to be motivational, but I found myself in the category of motivational speaker uh, because people referred to me as such, voted me as such, and it led to the point of me being recognized officially by the global gurus for the last two years, um, the top 30 motivational speakers in the world absolutely fantastic but you know what um it's i think it's a lot of word work to be done when you motivate your own self do you also feel so that's true yes the motivation uh is internal and emanates outward and so uh, when i speak uh, the goal is to be able to reach inside the audience if you will and to motivate them individually and as a group yeah so did you always uh, find yourself so confident and you know speaking in front of public standing in front of audience and speaking or did you really work on yourself oh sure <laughs> <laughs> the truth is I, I believe that you know some people obviously are born with no fear when it comes to uh, professional speaking or public speaking uh, but the reality is the great majority of us, that's not the case. And I believe that's the, that's the same can be true said for, for me. Uh, there was a book that one time cited the number one fears that people have. Uh, yeah. Death was third. Uh -huh. Number one was speaking in front of a crowd. And so for me, I believe that obviously my upbringing and starting early at a young age had a lot to do with me gaining confidence. But like anyone else, there was always the fear when you stand in front of others and when you stand in front of others, you are submitting yourself to interrogation, to scrutiny. Yeah. Others are going to judge you. <laughs> and you're worried about everything from how you look to yeah. how you sound. And all of that is before you get to what you're really there to say and speak on. And so uh, a lot of uh, fears and a lot of uh, inadequacies that individuals may carry uh, can really take over when you stand before peers or stand before strangers. And so uh, it certainly is, a, is, a, is a, a confidence that must be developed. And that confidence comes over time, A, through conviction of what you have to say, B, through massive preparation. 
But then I believe uh, the C part of that is knowing how people are going to react to what you have to say, knowing you're going to make a difference, knowing that people will be moved, will be pleased, and actually be changed or be different as a result of having experienced you on the stage as a motivational speaker. So Eddie, um, you know, during lockdown, I also observed, and this is also new work for me, uh, Discover Your Second Act literally is a space where I do transformational workshops. I speak a lot in front of the public in different forums. But definitely a lot of people have started to coach during this time. A lot of hand holding happened because people needed this space as well. And that mushroomed a lot of people who uh, caught on to making it like their second act or like, you know, their, um, another thing that they could explore as coaches, speakers, um, uh, facilitators. So how do you actually differentiate yourself? And there are so many people out there. What, how do people like me who are young in the trade, who are developing their skills in coaching, mentoring, uh, facilitation, how do we differentiate ourselves? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> and I, I say that uh, truthfully because every every business has that question, and I believe every coach should look at themselves as a business. We're running a business, but we often may not look at ourselves as a business. So when a a sneaker company, Nike, Reebok, or any of those of, of those organizations, when they want to differentiate themselves from their competitor, uh, they do uh, spend a lot of time thinking about what makes them different first and foremost. And then they spend a lot of time, almost equal amount of time, telling others what makes them different. So I believe it's up to every coach to identify what their brand is. What is my unique value proposition as a coach? Right. As you said, especially during the pandemic, the, 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 I just saw a stat from ICF the other day, the numbers exploded. They almost doubled. There's almost 60,000 certified coaches in the world now. Right. That's a yeah. lot yeah. of coaches. Yes, that's true. So how do you differentiate yourself? And then how do you go about telling people? Well, that's about your brand. So have you created a brand for yourself? And then do you market that brand? Uh, the biggest and best companies spend millions of dollars every year. In fact, even millions of dollars, even on 30 second <laughs> ads to tell people about their difference and why you should uh, purchase their product. And so as coaches, we should do nothing different. We may not spend millions of dollars on our brand or millions of dollars uh, promoting our, our brand, marketing campaigns, but certainly uh, we have the ability to leverage the greatest uh, tools uh, in social media, which is democratize our ability to build a brand, our ability to market that brand, to get our word out there and separate ourselves from our competition. Yeah, I think that's very valuable because you talk, talked about USP and I see your USP is leadership. And uh, definitely you are out there to change the face of leadership. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I spent about eight years or so as an independent leadership consultant. <laughs> and in my leadership practice, it <laughs> encompassed facilitation, it encompassed professional speaking, and executive coaching. Those are the three pillars I built my career on. And then I came into touch with the organization Linkage. The CEO, Jennifer McCullough, and I became friends. And she made me an incredible offer to join the organization and to work under her leadership. And so I accepted that offer. And it's about a year now that I'm coming up on that I've been with them formally. And I spent a year as an independent <laughs> consultant with them as well. So about two years with the organization overall. And their tagline, in fact, the mission statement is to change the face of leadership. Hmm. And that immediately resonated with me. Wow. And Linkage, uh, which you can learn more about at LinkageInc.com, Linkage uniquely helps women oh. and underrepresented minority groups to establish themselves as leaders in a way that few organizations can. One of the one of the uh, most significant uh, items that Linkage is known for is their Women in Leadership Conference. It's been running for about 24 years. This year, the first week in November, we're excited. November 1st to the 4th, we're excited about this running again. And last year, we had about 4,000 women from around the world attend. About 400 in person, 
and the others were online. So we're going to do another hybrid event this year. And so we look forward to, in, in Florida, welcoming uh, another four or 500 in person. But there will also be those who dial in remotely so that everybody can take advantage of the incredible lineup of keynote speakers we have. Beautiful, and I think uh, I should attend them because I do so much work on women myself. Um, you know, my programs are centered around women. I do a lot of work in the marginalized community with women. Maybe it's uh, something that I should really follow and um, sign up for. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> I would love to have you, Archana. And then anyone who's listening to this, certainly reach out to us at linkageinc.com or you can even email me, eturner at linkageinc.com. And uh, we'll make sure we get you connected to somebody who will take care of you, get you into one of the sessions, and you can attend all or just a select portion. And what we've done is made it accessible to people and not necessarily have to be in a corporation. So we have some passes that are within the budget of individuals uh, who may not be able to afford what it, maybe their corporation would be able to afford, because we want every woman to be able to benefit from this experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I will fall in the category of not so affording so far. <laughs> starting something new but yeah i would like to okay so whoever's listening this is a forum uh, let's all come together and uh, try and uh, make the best of this opportunity and also a platform where we all network and come together so thanks eddie for mentioning my pleasure um, eddie um uh, my next question is towards again you know the learnings that you uh, get when you work with leaders because um, when you're working with diverse sets uh, across maybe continents, you know, different people, different. Do you see a pattern of having same kind of issues, concerns across globally? Or do you think that, you know, there are different things that leaders are dealing with these days? That's a wonderful question in that sometimes people believe that leadership is unique to a specific area of the globe. And in, in some cases that may be true, but fundamentally across the board, there are specific uh, denominators that I think equally apply. Right. Number one would be uh, the need to lead in a crisis. If we didn't learn anything during COVID, we learned that everybody, no matter what level of leadership you were at, had a learning curve they had to ramp up on when it comes to leading during a crisis. Yeah. Uh, many leaders who uh, felt that they were extraordinary leaders, and they were, found that, wow, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. And so we all had to learn. So be it leading through a crisis, also the ability to have a global mindset as a leader. Yeah. Many times leaders become myopic and I only see my corner of the globe. In the 21st century, leaders can no longer afford to have that viewpoint or mindset. So every leader must have global thinking. The other thing I see in the, my work with leaders across the globe is, especially my women leaders, is that it seems that no matter what level a, a woman leader has risen to, there's still a level of self-doubt, or some would refer to it as the imposter syndrome. Yes. <laughs> and the foremost authority on that would be Sally Heldelson, who's written the book, How Women Rise. She's covered that extensively and can say it far better than I can. But in my work as an executive coach and my work as a facilitator of leadership, workshops, seminars, with leaders at the most senior levels, uh, I see it firsthand. Yeah, and I think a lot of them, like Brennan Brown speaks a lot about them. Uh, you know, the Lean In book um, I read through as well, you know, gives a lot of insights why women just don't take a chance to be right there on the face and be, you know, just always stay in self-doubt. And I think there is a lot of work to be done as well. But men are not far behind, by the way. They just um, pretend to be the strong one. But ultimately, the issues are the same, I think. No? What do you think? Absolutely. No, men also suffer from imposter syndrome, but do a little bit better job of masking it, according to the research. Huh, right. <laughs> in fact, you quoted Lean In. And one of the points that Lean In makes is that uh, a woman will uh, qualify for 90% of the job in a job description and will not apply for it because she doesn't meet the requirements 100%. Right. A man will only qualify with 70% of what's required of the job and apply anyway. <laughs> so in some cases, men do suffer from imposter syndrome, but far more often, men suffer from, uh, we suffer from a, perhaps an overinflation of our, 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 our ego and a little bit of overconfidence of what we can deliver. 
<laughs> That's true. So I also hear that you talk about purposeful leadership and what is that in your definition? Yes, indeed. Purposeful leadership is a unique leadership model that I use in my work at Linkage. In my work at Linkage, this model that you see on the screen, uh, this is my practice area. So the first area I mentioned to you was our work with advancing women leaders. It's a whole area that we focus on. We have a diagnostic tool, an assessment that we issue on that. And of course, we run that major conference. The other big thought leadership we have is this model, purposeful leadership, right. meaning it's not by accident. It's intentional. And it's not something that only a few people can do, that they're born as a leader. No, purposeful leadership is a model everyone can follow. And it starts with the five big circles you see. Yeah. Number one in the center is the become. And we call these commitments. This is the research of Mark Hannum right. and his team that undertook this model. And Mark says you have to become. Who are, who are you becoming as a leader on internally? And I wrote an article about President Zelensky. Uh, to me, he epitomized this model better than anybody at the time. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this in uh, March. Right. And uh, the idea of internally, we don't know who someone's becoming as a leader. But we start to see it and manifest outwardly. And the first thing we see is in the way that they inspire. And we say you have to inspire by not just what you say, but also by what you do. Mm -hmm. And we call it what you say communicating evocatively. You have to be able to evoke emotion in people, to rile people and stir them to see a bigger vision, paint a vision for the future and steer them toward that and that your actions ma match that. And so with President Zelensky, the example that we saw was, hey, yes, here is a yes. nation under assault and he had an option to leave. And he said to me, was the quote of the century, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. Right. And so his words stirred a nation and had grandmothers <clears throat> ready to talk to the soldiers, wives leaving their children on, on the front line, leaving their children in another country, coming back to the front lines with their husband because their leader chose to physically be there. So it was his words and his visual presence. But then when leaders are inspiring, people are engaged. So now people want to be committed. They want to do what you want them to, uh, what you've asked of them but also leaders see the need to not only engage people to mobilize them, but also to let go. Sometimes leaders get promoted and they still keep doing the work that they got promoted from. Well, that doesn't allow you to be strategic. You need to have a higher level view. Once people are engaged, they're involved in doing the work. Well, now they can be innovative. They'll start to look when they're not being ruled out of fear and intimidation and threats, they'll start to be creative and new solutions, new processes, new procedures, innovation, the oh. heart of every business. <clears throat> and then finally, that means that you're able to achieve. You're putting points on the board. You're getting things done. You're delegating and, and people are uh, thriving in the organization individually and collectively. But notice there's a green ring running around all of that. And the green ring that we see running around all of that is inclusion. Purposeful leaders are also inclusive at every stage. No longer, according to the research from McKinsey and our own internal research at Linkage, no longer is it good enough to be a homogenous team. Diverse teams outperform homogenous teams every single time. Yes. And so we believe that you must be inclusive while you're also being a purposeful leader. I just love it and thank you for showing that slide. It just makes it more compact and easier to understand, but I love it from becoming to actually, you know, the end result of achieving it all the way. So thanks Eddie and um, I will follow this model as well because I want to become a purposeful leader. I think in my second act, purpose is something which overplays everything else. So uh, this is a great model to follow. Whenever I, I think as a leader, when I will fail, or falter, I will look up um, your strategy in the slide. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, of course. Absolutely. Thank you. you. You talked about inclusivity, and this question I've asked for many speakers who've come. And, um, you know, while inclusive for some is including more women in the workforce and leadership circles, while inclusive is probably uh, creating an infrastructure for disability or you know, introducing LGBTQ in the workspaces, 
what is being inclusive? Uh, another fantastic question. And uh, for some people, they might think only about gender. They yeah. may only think about race. But when we think about being inclusive, it really means being inclusive and expanding that lens. We need to think about religion, uh, especially here in the Western world. You may not recognize what a person's religion is if, if they practice one of the more main, uh, larger religions in the world. Because unless they have <laughs> medallion on their neck or such, you don't know. But others, their religion is shown by their forehead or their garb. Well, we must be inclusive of those individuals in our life as well, in our workplaces. What about those who are disabled, not able-bodied, right? They lost their hearing, they lost their sight, they lost a limb or whatever it may be. Uh, do we make room for those individuals as a part of our team, as a part of our leadership? Uh, ageism, some people wanna uh, cast off those of, of our senior age uh, and put them off the pasture as it may speak. Or maybe those who are young, they may say, oh, you're too young, you're a little whippersnapper, we don't need you. Uh, there's so many different classes where we uh, need to be inclusive and in making sure that our organizations, our teams are reflective of the world that we serve. With Eddie, coming back to the education that you know we all go through while we are young, um, inclusivity as a topic is still not um, a part of what we learn in school. Uh, we uh, grow up like that, and then we are put in workforces where we are told now be inclusive. What do you think, um, you know, what, what is your point of view on that? Well, that's an interesting perspective. And, 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 and I guess it perhaps depends on where we're being educated. And some areas are doing a better job of that, I think, these days than others. Uh, we have uh, some places, for example, that recognize that some people need a room for prayer. And they need a specific break period to be able to offer their prayer because that's their part of religion. Um, I know in, in our company, one of the things we've started to do is even to make sure that we've expanded the holidays that we recognize. Because for a long time, they were only of a certain mainstream religion. Right. If it wasn't this religion, we didn't recognize the holiday, holy days for other religions. And so <clears throat> I think that it definitely starts with education, as you mentioned, uh, at the lower levels of education in school going into high school and the collegiate level, and then we can have workplaces that are inclusive. So starting early makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So Eddie, I'm wary of the time. Uh, so I will jump on to the most important question on this podcast, which is what's your second act? And second act as I describe it is a purpose, a bigger meaning, something that motivates me, something that gives me inspiration every day. Uh, something that I discovered along the line, and that's why my second act is gone. What's your second act? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. I have a second act professionally and personally, and ah. the personal does affect the professional. My oh. second act is, you know, I was married for 13 years, never thought I'd be divorced, ended up divorced, and then I got married, I had a second chance on uh, uh, a second opportunity for love, got married, 7 7 17, just celebrated five years of marriage. And I'm an old man, <laughs> but I became a dad and that was unexpected. But oh. thanks to the COVID lockdowns, there we are. So I'm a dad, of a beautiful 18 month old daughter. That's the second act for me. Wow. It's a new phase of life I never thought mm -hmm. I'd have. And I now realize what I've been missing all these years without having a child in my life. So I am learning every day and I am being, I would say, perhaps even refined and disciplined in some ways by now being a dad. Um, so that truly is a second act. And that spills over to my, my professional career. My first career was one in large corporations and skyscrapers uh, in, in, in a busy, bustling city. And it was an in information technology. Well, my second act professionally was that I switched over to doing the work I'm doing now, leadership development. I still love IT. But now I spend all my time developing leaders in every industry imaginable. And that's important now. I never knew I'd be a dad, but my ability mm -hmm. now to be able to work anywhere at any time Hi. is helpful. With that. <clears throat> it allows me to be able to uh, flex my schedule, to be able to pick up my daughter every single day and not miss that. You know, if there's times of periods I'm traveling, of course, but if I'm in town, I'm able to get her, spend quality time with her. Uh, the ability to work from home, 
Uh, those days, inevitably, when, the, when they go to the school and they bring back all the little germs they bring back, mm -hmm. I have the ability to be here and uh, make sure that I'm part of getting her uh, nursed back to health. So the flexibility that comes because of doing this type of work. Great. Um, thank you for sharing that. And it's fantastic that you have uh, defined both your personal and your professional side of the second act. And um, normally we don't hear that, but thank you for discussing your personal side, especially, and say hello to your daughter. Um, I cannot let you go before I ask you about the podcast because <laughs> that is something that keeps me going as well. And, uh, you know, that is something that I discover so many things about myself and learn new things. Um, you have a podcast, Keep Leading. What was your idea behind it? And um, why did you start that? I started the Keep Leading podcast almost on a dare. Uh, my <laughs> good friend... I had just finished my first book, my uh, it's right behind me, uh, 140 Simple Messages to Guide MRG Leaders. I had finished the book and I was working on the second book. And he challenged me and says, no, you should start a podcast. You'll reach more people that way. And we had this kind of debate back and forth. And I did it with basically, I think maybe 45 days later, I launched the show. And it ended up being one of the best decisions I ever made. Never got the second book finished. But the podcast, I went on to produce 133 episodes across wow. two and a half years, I believe. And when I joined Linkage, I ended the show because of the work that I'm doing here now. But the show is called Keep Leading. And I named it Keep Leading because of my passion for leadership. And I'm a continuous learner. And when it comes to leadership, I feel that like a physician, they always refer to themselves as practicing medicine. Uh, in leadership, I believe I'm a practitioner. I will never have it fully mastered. I believe I'm a leadership expert, but even experts continue to learn and grow. So I call it keep leading because be it learning how to lead, you must keep doing it. It's a continuous process. Or if you're in a leadership position, you have to keep leading because sometimes people reach a leadership position and they stop leading. And people are looking at them going, you're the one in charge. Give me action, give me results, give me service. So I believe that that is something that every leader needs to keep in mind. So I named the show Keep Leading. And across that period, I had the great honor to interview some of the top thought leaders in the world who wow. express different ways wow. that you can keep leading. I, I have heard a few episodes. They are very impressive. And uh, thanks, because they are really great nuggets there on if somebody wants to hear about everything leadership encompasses definitely um eddie uh, we have a rapid fire question uh, round uh, which is like quick and uh, witty and uh, bring your humor in as a leader and let's see how you do it here are you ready <laughs> i'm ready okay so how do you describe yourself to others i describe myself to others as a continuous learner Great. Um, what are the key highlights in your life? Key highlights in my life? Well, I'd start with my uh, uh, baptism and, and, and confessing my sins and giving myself to uh, God and my faith and becoming an ordained minister and my, my marriage and my birth of my daughter. Oh, so good. Uh, how have you managed failure? I've managed failures by welcoming them and learning from them. And I'd probably say also expecting them. Great. Uh, what's your fun side? <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a fun side. <laughs> of course. I don't know if I'm, I'm always working. Uh, oh. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Well, think about it and you can um, reply to me <laughs> via mail or LinkedIn. Any? I want to know what's your fun side. Um, okay. And um, the last one here. Um, what motivates you or who motivates you? Any book, person, life story, whatever. My answer probably would have been different six months ago, a year ago. Uh, you know, my motivation now is really about my my. I would still say everything centers around my faith and, and belief in, in my God, but uh, definitely my daughter is a powerful motivation for me now. 
wow. in, in all that I do. What's her name? April. Sorry, A? April. How do you spell it? April? Yes, like the month, oh. April. Oh, yes. so sweet. All right. So hello to April. Keep motivating Daddy, Eddie Turner. And thank you for being and doing some great work on leadership. We do need empathetic leadership. We need thoughtful leaders. And I think that uh, your work spells it all by itself. So thanks, Eddie. It's been an honor. Namaste. Thank you, Archana. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you.